Welcome to Spinning Back Click, where each week here at MMA Junkie, we take a spin through the biggest stories in MMA. I'm your host, Gorgeous George, and with me as always, some of the sharpest MMA minds in the biz. This week, we got Mike Bond from Toronto, fresh off his nomination for Best Journalist. You can vote for him at www.worldmmaawards.com. Go, Mike. Go, MMA Junkie. Nolan King joins us as well. As you can see, he's got a new spot in Beantown. The kid's moving on up, like they say goes from mma junkie radio here in the fight capital of the world in las vegas let's get to it fellas looking back on this past weekend's action jamal hill defeated diago santos in what was a fast-paced action-packed back and forth thriller the ufc appears to have a new title contender uh contender excuse me or is that too strong of a position for the dwcs alum champion jiri prochaska had previously suggested a rematch versus the former champion glover Teixeira. Jan Blanco, he ain't too happy about that. Something about a samurai code or whatever. Uh, Magomed Ankalaev, he's also been making some noise too. You got to give him his props. So sort things out for me, fellas. Who is the front runner in the UFC's light heavyweight division for a title shot? Four minutes are on the clock. Mike, you're leading off. Interesting times, right? Like not that long ago, we were just trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel for anything interesting at light heavyweight. And now we have multiple contenders. There's kind of a, a lot going on here. So it's nice to see what this division's turned into. I think in the kind of post John Jones era, it's now starting to take its real form and, you know, good things happening. And a guy like Jamal Hill, I think fits right in there. Um, I don't think he's quite ready for the title shot yet, but I think He's definitely showing some really good signs of being a guy that will be in that top five for years to come. Maybe he gets a title fight. Maybe he's champion. I think there's still a little more development. Uh, I don't think this was the performance, especially given Tiago Santos, one in five now in his past six. I don't think beating him right now at this moment is the fight that elevates you to a title shot, especially over a guy like Jan Bohovic being a former champion and the person who I do think is going to get the next title shot which will be Glover Teixeira and probably a rematch with Yuri Prohoshka. That first fight, still fight of the year right now, in my opinion. It holds up. Uh, they got to run that back. I think it's, the timing is right. I don't think anyone else in the division right now is like completely undeniable. So I do think that's the direction they'll go. And then they'll end up just kind of sorting out the rest of those guys you named in terms of matching them up. But there is five of them total. So I think one person there is ultimately going to be the odd man out and probably have to fight someone outside of the top five and rank below them. So I'm really curious to see how this shakes out. But I do think it is going to start with to share again the title shot. All right, good stuff. Mike Nolan, you're up next. He's got to share in the pole position. How do you look at things? Yeah, there's only one right answer here, I think, and it's uh, Glover to share. I mean, it has to be. Um, you know, the guy, he's getting older, coming off the rematch. Uh, excuse me, it would be a rematch of one of the best fights of the year. Like, this just seems like a no-brainer to me at this point. I mean, if there was somebody out there that really screamed out that, you know, they had really demolished the division and they were surging, then we could have that conversation. And that's not to belittle Jamal Hill or Magomed Ankalaev or Jan Blachowicz, but I almost feel like in a certain regard, they all kind of cancel each other out. Like it's it's hard to pick between them because they're all just kind of there. They're doing well. They're on the, the right path for this, but there's not somebody that you can say is getting definitively robbed if they run it back with Glover Teixeira. And I mean, Yuri Prohaska wants that fight. Glover Teixeira wants that fight. None of the fans are going to complain about that fight. So unfortunately for three guys, they're going to have to sit on the sideline and, and figure out, uh, you know, who's fighting who. And like Mike said, somebody's going to be the odd man out. But uh, Yeri, Glover, no brainer. Um, hopefully by the end of this year and, and we get this division, uh, we don't we don't stay too stagnant. And these guys can uh, can be fighting for a title in six months, you know. All right, goes. Is it a sweep? Do you agree or that code, man? The code was broken, according to the former champ, Blockowitz. The samurai code. Look. I don't understand this because I do agree. I do think Glover Teixeira is the guy. They should make that matchup. It was an insane fight and people want to see it again. But why? what are they waiting for? You know, at first you probably think, okay, ankle live. Let's see what happens there. Jamal Hill. All right. Why are we waiting this long? This is a fight that I think a lot of people want to see a rematch to because it was back and forth. There was a little bit of low fighter IQ in that one. And yeah, okay. Got sloppy at times, but it was just a great fight. And I think it comes down to a business decision. Do you risk a guy like Glover Teixeira at his age with the wear and tear that he has on his body, waiting a little bit, possibly getting hurt, possibly losing a fight? I think it's just dumb to do that. I don't understand why they just don't make that rematch. A guy like Jamal Hill, yes, he looked impressive. And I think he is ready for this type of fight. 
But the guy's been learning so fast, and he has such a good fighter IQ. He knows when to put his foot on the gas. He knows when to take his foot off. He was really smart in this fight, and that was a good Thiago Santos. I think he can benefit from one more fight. It's only going to help him. So why not just wait a little bit, announce this fight, give us what we all want, and then, yeah, this division is popping now. It's going to be a lot of fun going forward. All right, great stuff, guys. But one of you three has to give me something that I want. What does that leave? Give me the next matchup. It's got to be block over. It says either Hill or Ankaliyev. Who's the odd man out? One of you. Hill's the odd man out, I think. Oof. Okay. Two votes. Right. Yeah. So what have you done for me lately does not apply here. The veterans get it. All right. Good stuff, guys. You guys did great. All right. Next one. Also this past weekend, Anthony Pettis was bounced from the playoffs by Stevie Ray at 2022 PFL playoffs one. <laughs> Can it get more awkward than that? The former UFC and WEC lightweight champions bid to win the third major title will have to wait. And further to that, his contract expires after this season. Guys, you know he got paid well. Did the PFL get a return that get the return that they wanted? And should they bring him back? Four minutes are on the clock. Nolan, it's on you, sir. Yeah, I think that they have gotten the return. I mean, we've seen it before. I think Bellator when Scott Coker took over. You know, they used all these name recognitions to get people familiar with some of the, the newer up and coming, you know, elite fighters that may not have the reputations of an Anthony Pettis, uh, you know, or for Bellator's sake, Chael Son and whoever. PFL's done the same thing. Granted, they've grabbed guys that maybe are a little bit more competitive and aren't over the hill as much as, as Bellator did. But I think it's a working recipe. I think it's something that um, we kind of underestimate how much uh, a name recognition, you know, plays into people tuning in like people get attached to these guys the superstars that the former champions of a couple of years ago of yesteryear and they end up really wanting to follow their career so I think the investment was there you needed guys when you were building from the ground up the first few seasons to, to get those bigger names um, Anthony Pettis was among them now I think it hits the point when we see the salaries come out and you see how much Anthony Pettis is getting paid where it's like a, it's you gotta weigh things right sure he's gonna bring in eyeballs but if he continues to lose uh, you know, losing back-to-back -back fights against Stevie Ray, then you start to question, like, you know, is there somebody else that PFL could could have that similar investment with that may, uh, you know, be able to kind of last a little bit longer or be able to go further in the tournament? Um, and that's really what they've got away. So I wouldn't be shocked if Anthony Pettis parts ways. I think there are other options for him out there. He's still got enough of a name. It's not like he's one of these people that's getting knocked out every fight. But I think we've hit that point with PFL where it might just be best for everybody involved to just see what else is out there and maybe end up splitting, um, especially when you see that payday that he's been that he's been getting apparently um, with those those uh, salaries that came out from Georgia. The dude cracked the code, man. He's winning these million dollars each season without having to win the the whole thing. <laughs> How about you, guys? What are your thoughts? It's a very tough situation for Anthony Pettis, but I do see a light at the end of the tunnel, like Nolan said. Look, when you put a guy on a card like that, like an Anthony Pettis, people tune in, regardless of who he's fighting or what the situation is. We all remember the Showtime kick. We all think at any moment this guy could do something nutty that you just don't want to be the guy that, that has to hear about it the next day, right? There's some value to that. Now, the contract is so big with PFL that I don't think it makes sense for them to renew anything like that, and maybe even anything close to that. I think he parts ways with PFL, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have life outside of, of PFL. There are plenty of things he could do. You know, Bellator has a relationship with his brother. At first, I know he said he didn't want to take away too much from his brother, but his brother's established his name over there, and we all know who he is. So maybe he could go over there to Bellator, do something there. Um, one championship, you know, we saw what they did with Demetrius Johnson, some of these hybrid fights. Maybe he could get a one-off over there or something, or even boxing and thriller. He's a striker. I think people just want to tune in and see Anthony Pettis. So I think he'll pop up somewhere else, just not the PFL. All right, how about you, Mike? If you were running the ship over there, what would be your decision for 2023? I think it depends on kind of where the money gets allocated potentially elsewhere. I think there's a few free agents, PFLs, keeping its eye on that you know could be coming up soon. They'd like to grab, and if they can't get those deals done, I think they have you know money that they want to invest, and maybe that's when they look at Anthony Pettis and say, hey, let's talk about a new deal. We have uh, some money to spend here, and they bring him back. So I think that is probably the most likelihood, but I don't know. It's tough, man. Like, do you want to put your money down for this guy right now? He gets injured in every single fight, it seems. He broke both of his hands, he said, in this fight. Before that, it was a rib injury. Before that, it was something else. So it's like, uh, is it really worth it at this point? I'm, I feel like promoters out there might be reluctant to sign Anthony Pettis, especially for that type of money. I mean, I'm sure, obviously, certain promoters would kill to have him, but at a more realistic fee. So 
I feel bad to kind of say, I think Anthony Pettis' days of making that kind of money are probably over at this point. This loss, the way it happened, the back-to-back to Stevie Ray twice in six weeks, all that stuff, it felt like kind of a, a turning point for the worst for Anthony Pettis. So I'm curious to see what ultimately ends up happening, but I don't think he'll be back with PFL next year. All right, fellas, great job. Uh, let's move on to topic number three, turning the page and looking forward. What are the stakes this weekend? With Dominic Cruz versus Marlon Vera at UFC on ESPN 41. We have a former champ versus someone on the quest to be a champ. They're getting down in America's finest city, Cruz's hometown of San Diego. Again, the question, what are the stakes this weekend? Goes, get the party started four minutes. The stakes are a little odd in this one, guys, because honestly, there's what makes the most sense for the division and all that. But then there's what's at stake for the hardcores, their fan, their hearts, right? What's at stake for them in that? You have one of these guys that's from that WEC era, that that old card guard that's starting to kind of fade away a little bit here. Uh, this is Dominic Cruz. It's one of his last chances here to, to really do something. We just saw Donald Cerrone retire. You know, Jose Aldo still doing his thing, but there aren't too many of these guys left. And Dominic Cruz, he just seems like one of these guys. Like, remember, he's making money outside of fighting. He's a broadcaster, an analyst. He he can do other things. I don't see him fighting anymore unless he legitimately thinks he can fight for a title and win a title so i don't think he's going to stick around if he loses this fight i think it might be it for him if you look at cheeto vera he's in a decent position but there are a lot of people fighting for the same spot um one name that comes to mind is sean o'malley sean o'malley's got a big fight here okay if he wins that fight there's no way in hell they're going to give him another fight at that level i think if he wins that fight he's probably going to be the ufc's guy but where it gets tricky is Cheeto Vera has a win over him, right? So what happens there? I don't know. We're not allowed to really pick sides or anything, so I'm not going to do that, but I have a soft spot for the WEC, guys. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Vera better be active on that mic, man, because yeah, O'Malley's got a big fight coming up, too. Up next is Mike Bond. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously a huge fight for both guys. Uh, Dominic Cruz, if he wins this, he's right back, you know, where he wants to be in that title mix. But Bantamweight is just crazy. I mean, it's hard to say where the chips are ultimately going to fall here and how things are going to go. Um, a lot of these guys, you know, some of them have fought each other. It'd be interesting. TJ Dillashaw beats Aljamain Sterling and Dominic Cruz wins that. They have a history. Uh, of course, you mentioned, you know, Cheeto and... Uh, Sean O'Malley there's just so many different combinations you can go with in this direction in this division so I love it all um, I'm really curious to see how this fight all unfolds and I think Cheeto Vera when I talked to him you know last month at Ruka kind of put it best he isn't saying that you know I win this I'm title shot guaranteed he think ultimately the UFC with all these big bantamweight fights coming up we got Jose Aldo and Mareb Devalishvili coming up at UFC 278 next week um, he just thinks whoever had the most impressive and best performance is going to be the guy to get the opportunity. And I tend to agree with that. So, yeah, as we kind of talk about pretty frequently on this program, Bantamweight is just an embarrassment of riches. And this main event this weekend is once again another showcase of that. For sure. And I can't wait, man. The last main event was awesome with Sil Hill and Santos. Let's see if they pass, pass that baton to these two. Nolan King, finish things off. Yeah, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with uh, Cheeto's assessment of of that whole landscape you know i'm not saying it's impossible for the, either one of these guys to get a title shot but i think when you look at the sean o'malley peter Dion, if when you look at uh jose aldo versus marab i almost feel like those fights are like a little step ahead in terms of the the ufc's um cast system here and what they're looking for i mean who knows we don't know how these things play out if sterling wins again if Jan wins that kind of eliminates that trilogy so there, there's a lot of different things that can happen but i would say that the most likely stakes here for this fight is that it's kind of like a title eliminator eliminator right so the guy that wins this will probably position himself uh in a title eliminator that's kind of the way that i feel with this whole thing um i think that that bantamweight right now is just gross it's so it's so good there's just so much talent um so who knows maybe if cheeto goes out there head kicks dominic cruz or something he'll be the guy that you know i'll eat crow and next week i'll be saying he should have a title shot but i just think right now with uh, with Sean O'Malley, the hype train finally hitting this, you know, reaching the station, so to speak, and then also you got Marab and, and Jose Aldo and the name that he brings. With not a million years left in fighting, uh, these guys are, are probably the third, the third uh, man out, so to speak, third matchup out. All right, guys, quick, good stuff, but quick nod of the head: if Cheeto Vera obliterates Cruz and O'Malley has a snoozer against Yawn, could that head-to-head? 
supersede the popularity and the freight train that's Sean O'Malley? Yeah, no. I, th- I think Dominic O'Malley Cruz. Only? When you're when you're talking about Dominic Cruz, I think he's in the running for a title shot, literally at any point in time. Look what happened with him fighting for the belt against Henry Cejudo. So I think uh, as long as he wins, even if it's ugly, depending how the chips fall, he's right there. Yeah, it's a n- name recognition tiebreaker for sure. Um, Cruz, you know, once you hold the belt, you're 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 gonna get those big opportunities. It's crazy too. I saw somebody tweet. I think it was MMA Mania. This is only Cruz's tenth UFC fight. I feel like he's it's just like crazy to think about yeah those injuries yeah. man long long setbacks all right uh let's go to the next topic looking forward even more a huge announcement for from the ufc for ufc 281 in new york city november 12th that's what they told us this past week so ufc middleweight champion israel adesanya will defend his title against alex pejeda these two have met before in kickboxing pejeda's up two nothing iced them once too but Pajeda's only 6-1 and one in MMA, though he is coming off a big win over Sean Strickland. Guys, what do you think, man? Is 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 it perfect? MSG, Stylebender, November, does this sound about right to you guys? And you know I don't hate the uh, early predictions either if you want to take a stab. Mike Bond, we're coming back to you. Four minutes. Yeah, uh, this is a home run for this card, as I kind of, I think I tweeted out in my immediate reaction for this. The only fight I think could have been better uh, for this MSG show this year would have been John Jones' heavyweight debut. Uh, but I know he's not too keen on fighting New York because of the state taxes, and they just couldn't get a deal done that soon. It seems like he might not even be ready to go, or at least them be able to get an opponent ready to go for November. So to me, this was the next best option that made the most sense. Uh, it's a great way to kind of thrust Israel Adesanya back in just to the very top of like your marketing ploy. Obviously, New York is such a big media market. You want to put that pass fight behind you against Jared Kanyer. We obviously know what the reaction was there. And this one is one that's going to take people's minds right off it. I mean, of course, we know the history between him and Pahea and kickboxing and then now coming to MMA. It's the perfect storyline pretty mar- remarkable that Alex Pahea is headlining an MSG show so early in his UFC run, but I guess that just goes to show where Izzy's at and where this fight's at. So to me, it was the the right recipe. I think it's going to have the perfect amount of hype, the c- type of fight you need for a Madison Square Garden show. So I think they did a great job, and I think the rest of the card is going to fill out nicely too. It's one hell of a start. Nolan, you feeling it too? I'm feeling it. I think this is phenomenal. It's been a while since we've had like a massive fight for the hardcores. You know what I mean? Like one of those fights that I think, sure, it's going to have some reach outside of the, uh, you know, into the casuals. I'm sure people will tune in. The UFC seems like right now, the pay-per-view events in general, it doesn't really matter. They're just home runs left and right. But this one, I think in particular, it's kind of got almost like that Jones Cormier feel where it's 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 a big fight regardless of what kind of fan you are. But to us hardcores, I mean, this is awesome. This is a great rivalry. We've seen it build. I mean, we were writing stories about, you know, Alex's jump back into MMA when he was fighting for LFA and Izzy was the champ. This has been the storyline the entire time up. It's not like Izzy won the belt six months ago and oh, look who the next contender is. No, this is something that, that has been talked about over and over and over again. And the way that the UFC fast-tracked Alex was very uh, risky, I think, to a certain, you know, in a certain regard. And, and sure enough, the, everything, the chips fell where they needed to go. And we have a massive fight here. I'm excited to see what else they throw on this card. I hate giving New York too much credit, obviously, for, for obvious reasons. But uh, this card, there's going to be a banger there in New York City uh, in November. I can't wait. Yeah, and they set things up perfectly, having those two on the same card last month so it transfers over nicely how about you goes what are your thoughts here i think this fight's gonna be fireworks at the press conference now i'm not one of those guys that likes to tear down izzy i actually think he did what he had to do in the last fight to get it done i respect the guy i think uh the style bender will come back for this type of fight but i don't even know if it's gonna be because he's motivated or because he wants to prove the fans wrong i just think Bahia's style is not going to give him any room to breathe. I think he's going to get in his face and possibly do something that not a lot of fighters have done, and that's force Izzy to, to fight come from behind, right, in rounds. We don't see that too often. I don't think Israel Adesanya is going to be too comfortable in this fight. Now, a lot of people are talking about them fighting and kickboxing, and I understand upstairs it probably does hold a little room up in Israel Adesanya's head, but this is MMA, right? Like, I mean, Urena Bars has a win over Chris Cyborg in Muay Thai. But if they fought MMA, it's just a completely different beast. I think maybe a little bit in Israel's head, but not a lot. I think he's going to overcome that. I think he's really going to put some pressure on Bahia as well. 
and we're going to get what we want. And that's kind of the old style bender that we were used to getting. It's going to be one hell of a matchup. And hopefully they do get in each other's face a little bit, because really, if you're fighting at Madison Square Garden, your faces are up on that billboard. Not a lot of people get that honor and you have to really make something out of it. Yeah, I, I would disagree, though, Goes. I think it's in his head a little bit more than he's letting on. Um, it's just that Pajeda hasn't continued to push buttons because he's kind of just a stoic guy. He doesn't really talk much, you know. But when Strickland was mentioning it, it looked like it flustered him. He, there's just kind of no comeback for that. But we shall see. Uh, all right, finishing things up here. Get the binoculars out. We're going to look forward even more. John Jones, the heavyweight, tweeted this weekend. He said a few things. Uh, first of all, to those of you that said he looked a little slow in a video that he recently posted up, you just added to the motivation. He's in a bulking phase, according to him. Some of you also said the dude's taking too long. He's never going to fight. Well, he says that means you're impatient, and that's a great problem to have. Nice spins. I like it, Bones. There's whispers about November, he even said. But then he said, no clue. So, guys, I mean, this is getting ridiculous. He hasn't fought in two and a half years. Trump was still president. The pandemic hadn't even started. KC had just beaten my Niners the week before. We've had two Super Bowl champs since then. Has anyone misplayed their hand worse than John Jones abdicating his throne at 205 to move to heavyweight? Four minutes are on the clock. Nolan, take it away. Yeah, it's just an unfortunate situation, to be honest with you. I mean, I think we have one of the – it's almost like when McGregor took that time off, right, when he went to boxing and we hadn't seen him fight for MMA, MMA forever. I feel like – it's kind of the similar vibe minus the boxing fight. Like we missed out on who knows what, who knows what kind of performances John Jones could put on, who knows what kind of super fights we missed out on. So it's unfortunate that, that we waited this long. I actually initially, when he was like, Oh, I'm going to take, you know, the rest of the year off, whatever year it was, 2020 or 2021, whatever, when he, in the UFC were butting heads, I was kind of about it. I was like, Oh, this is good. We actually get to see him not rush in his transition to heavyweight, you know, that's obviously um, something that takes a little bit of, of work and takes a while to bulk up. But now, I mean, we've been talking about John on this, on this program, on our website, on everything forever. I mean, this is just uh, this heavyweight debut, excuse me. You know, it's just, I'm sick of talking about it. I think that we've wasted too much time. Who knows what kind of, um, you know, what, what time has done to John, who knows how sharp his skills are or, or compared to when he left off or what could have been if he had just debuted right off the bat. Uh, I will say it's helping him. I think that he's, you know, going from light heavyweight to heavyweight. If he was a lighter weight fighter, it might be, uh, you know, a different story there. A lot of these heavyweights are older and slower or whatever, but I just want to see it, man. You know, I, I don't understand what the holdup is at this point. Seems like Dana's saying, you know, that they're looking for him. John's seeming like he's ready to come back, you know, I guess maybe it's on whoever, Stipe, Francis, whatever, but I'm just sick of talking about it. You know, let's hopefully the next time we, we bring up John's name on this, it's about what kind of fight he has or whatever, because it's just, man, taking too much time. Yeah. All right, Goes, how do you feel? It's weird. I go back and forth on this a lot, man. I've seen a mixture of this in mixed martial arts before, fighters coming back too early or, or uh, you know, long layoffs. Like Dominic Cruz, we brought him up. He was off for three years, came in and got a big win, right? So, I mean, I think it's different for every fighter, but the difference here is John isn't coming back to light heavyweight. He's essentially driving a new car, right? He's reinventing himself as a heavyweight, and your body has to go through some sort of transformation, and I get that. His style has to change, but I don't know. I mean, there's something about that killer instinct that you have with inside of you, and if you're not fighting, it kind of goes away. We've heard fighters say that. So he needs to do that and he needs to do that times 10 because every guy in this division is going to try and knock his head off and they all hit really really hard so if i look at maybe some of the positives of him waiting this long i guess in a way he could walk into a situation where he's getting the champion possibly a championship title fight and he's coming off a major injury but that's about it man i really think these delays are, are hurting him a little bit more than he thinks new camp new training partners uh, getting through a camp with all that extra weight, it's just a little different, man. I, I, I don't know that. I hope he's not taking it for granted because really when we get him at heavyweight, we want to see the best John Jones. All right. How about you, Mike? Oh, these tweets were hilarious, man. You guys got to stop being so impatient, right? It's only been like three years. I mean, what's the rush, everyone? I mean, it's just this guy, man. Like, I, John Jones, obviously one of the greatest fighters ever. 
Um, but the way this is dragged out, the only thing that would make this wait worthwhile is the whole reason he was sat sitting out in the first place. He wasn't happy with his contract. He wanted different money to be a heavyweight. He wanted, you know, this percentage or this percentage. He started working with Richard Schaefer. I don't know what the status of that relationship is currently, but if John Jones is coming back on the same deal he had when he lost what is a light heavyweight, this was absolutely a massive waste of his time, a waste of years of his career. If he comes back to the exact contract or the that he wants, then okay, awesome. He played it exactly as he should have. So that's the only saving grace for me. Uh, bulking phase, I mean, it's been three years almost. You know you've been doing this for the majority of that time. Um, I can understand the criticism about him potentially looking a little bit slow. We saw the one time he did try to bulk up against OSP. He did not look very good in that fight, so I can see why people may have questions about it. But, yeah, man, it's just the John Jones saga continues to go. I hope he gets everything he wants and we can see him in a fight with Francis Ngannou or Stipe Miocic soon because those are the only options. Yeah, guys, and you know that stadium here in Vegas is about two years old. I remember thinking, oh, when the stadium was built. I could see Jones being one of the headliners. Same with Connor. One guy's partying in the Mediterranean, and the other guy's bulking up right now to sell out Allegiant Stadium. I mean, I don't, even, I don't know what his drawing power is right now. It's tough to tell. Yeah. All right, guys. Good stuff as always, folks. Get in the comment section down below. Tell us what you think. I'm in there throwing elbows every single week with a lot of you savages. And don't forget, this week we got Dana White Contender Series. 49, Bellator 284, 2022 PFL Playoffs 2. <laughs> it's like I'm telling you a riddle or something. Cage Warriors 142, and of course, the aforementioned UFC on ESPN 41. It's all covered by the best in the business here at MMA Junkie. So give us follows across social, check it out, and we'll see you next week to cover it all here on the Spinning Back Click. <laughs>